We are in um, the book of Habakkuk. You can open your Bibles up today to the book of Habakkuk. And we are in this prophetic book. And I have entitled this message uh, series, The Embracing God, because I believe Habakkuk's name kind of carries the idea of to embrace. And so Habakkuk is helping us to see how we can embrace our God and believe fully and trust him completely for everything. So Habakkuk is having us to embrace our God. To embrace is a, basically a synonym for trust or faith. It's, a, it's not one of the strongest ones, but it is one of them. You embrace what you want, what you hold on to. You embrace it. Uh, if somebody falls into the ice, what's the first thing they want to do? They want to embrace something to get out, correct? So their life depends upon holding on something solid so they can get out of there and have life. Well, this is what it is. And then last week we saw this really amazing uh, section where in Habakkuk 2.4, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. And so there's a contrast with the proud, the arrogant, which uh, we see in the book of Habakkuk. We see in many places in Scripture. The proud one is a self-truster. The proud one is a self-truster. He has his own glory in mind. And it's, it's amazing how that comes out many times, even in people who are woe-begone people. They're just down and out all the time. There's still this self-trust, and so they, they live in that, that gloom and doom. But the righteous, uh, he is, lives by faith. He, and basically the way I see when it says the righteous lives by faith, that word faith kind of carries this idea he who is there to be trusted. The righteous lives by he who is there to be trusted. The I am. The righteous shall live by faith in the I am. The God to be trusted. The Aman. There. The word, it says, embrace, so we embrace his words. First, he, God has the first word and the last word. And so we embrace what he says because he is the I am. In Habakkuk, God answers the prophet's questions. It's wonderful. He actually answers the, the prayers of Habakkuk, which take the form of a complaint or a lament. So Habakkuk is just looking at the circumstances around him. They're not good. Um, his sensitive heart towards the things of God seems to be just crushed a little bit by what's going on around him. But the amazing thing is, and no, it's not amazing. I won't even say it that way. It's not amazing that God answers us. It's not. He said he would. So Habakkuk went to him, as we should go to him, even in the midst of the things that go on, and, and be cautious about how you make your laments to God. Be cautious in how you complain to him because your heart will be revealed in your complaint. But at the same time, God loves to open our hearts up and draw, draw us to himself and find in him everything that we really need. So there's two proud ones, these two arrogant ones that are in the book of Habakkuk. We looked at the first one in uh, chapters chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, which were Habakkuk's own people, the people of Jerusalem and Judah. They were the proud ones in some ways, too. They, were, they had God's word, and yet they decided to march to a different drummer and kind of manipulate God as far as, you know, they have him in name, but not in, not in heart. And so Habakkuk saw this and complained about it. Isaiah 3, 8 through 11, again, gives us the conditions that Habakkuk saw for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Their speech and their actions are against the Lord. To rebel against his glorious presence. The expression of their Pharisees bears witness against them. And they display their sin like Sodom. They don't even conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. <clears throat> Say to the righteous that it will be go well with him, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. So Habakkuk sees in his own nation the failings. How many of you have looked at the United States of America and can see the failings? I think I have a church of complainers. I want us to complain correctly, though. I want us to not 
be vicious and judgmental in our complaints. But who do you take your complaints to? You take them to God. But yes, plead. Plead for the nation, our nation. The second proud one that we see in the book of Habakkuk is Babylon, and that is in chapter 2 and verse 5 is the kind of the key verse for uh, understanding Babylon. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who never is at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. So Babylon is seen as this, and it is, it's this arrogant, proud nation. And both the unbelieving uh, and the proud of Jerusalem and Judea and Babylon, both of them, both reap their sowing. They both reap what they sow. Now we see that God, because of the promises he's given to Judah and to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then transferring now to us and the Lord Jesus Christ, um, there is a sureness of outcome for them that God will not forsake his inheritance, just as he will not forsake his inheritance in those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We, he promises these things, and he will deliver on them. He will deliver salvation to us. So God calls out this nation, and then what we see in Habakkuk and we see other places is that um, Israel is not the only chess piece on the board. Israel is not the only chess piece on the board, but God brings all these nations together, and he moves them for his sovereign purposes. So now we want to look here at, with Babylon in focus, because that is obviously what we're seeing here, is Babylon is in focus in verses 5 through 20. And I've got a picture here that kind of pictures a little bit of what I think maybe Habakkuk imagined. Now, this is obviously is not Babylonians, but if you were in a, if you were in a uh, fort out in the middle of somewhere and you saw this coming, what would you think was happening? Do you think they're coming for lunch? What are they coming for? Conquer. Take over. And so Babylon, in, in, um, for Habakkuk, when God says, I'm going to bring the Babylonians, Habakkuk had already seen scenes like this, probably. The Assyrians coming to Jerusalem. And so you have this barbarians at the gate kind of mentality that's going, what's, this is coming. And Babylon was strong. By the time of Habakkuk's day, Babylon was getting stronger. It hadn't, hadn't gotten to its ascendancy yet, but it was there. And so Babylon, when they think of Babylon, they think of this nation that wants to take over. Well, verse 5, is, like again, I say, is really important to our understanding of this thing about Babylon and, and, and in some ways the understanding of almost all arrogance. Proud. The pride of mankind, the pride of nations. So it's, there's, a, there's a, a, a part of him that is always desirous for more. But he begins by saying, moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who never is at rest. Now, this is coming right after that wonderful, the righteous shall live by his faith. And then God says, moreover. So he's, he's, put, he's tucking these, these promises of who he is and how he works in the midst of all these kind of rumblings, you could say, of the book of Habakkuk. Well... <coughs> I apologize. <clears throat> it says in the NIV that the wine betrays him. Well, what's going on here? Why, is it, why does he use language such as this? Well, Daniel chapter 5, this, is, comes, this comes obviously decades later after, um, after Habakkuk's time, but our God is the one who lays these things out. And we find Belshazzar, he was the uh, king after Nebuchadnezzar. And he was actually a kind of a co-ruler with his dad, but that's just how it worked. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for thousands of his nobles. So Belshazzar is king of Babylon. Babylon is in its height. It is conquered. It is the world power. 
feast for thousands of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousands. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines, drank from them. They drank the wine of the, that praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. That's arrogance. That's contemptible pride. That is not recognition of God creator and sustainer of all they did not give glory to god and everybody who does not give glory to god is without excuse every person who does not give honor and glory to god and recognize him for who he is is without excuse babylon the king and the officials and the people's characterized were characterized by greed Never enough. We see this in, in verse 5, 2, 5. Never enough. Never enough. Greed is as wide as Sheol. In other words, the grave. How many people can you keep sticking in the grave? Anybody who's alive. It just never ends. Every day. The grave is open somewhere. Every day. Receiving. It's a big mouth. Like death, he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Uh, Never enough. It's the, it's the person who goes berserk um, collecting salt and pepper shakers. Do I have any berserk people out there collecting salt and pepper shakers? You wouldn't raise your hand now anyway, would you? <laughs> Never enough. Got to have more. My sister was this way with Christmas for a while. Just more and more decorations, more and more and more and more. And if she ever listens to these messages, she'd, she'd agree with what I'm saying to you right now. Just more and more and more and more. And then finally she woke up somewhere six, seven years ago, goes, when is this going to end? And so she started getting rid of them and pared them back down again. But this is what, this is what pride is like. Pride is always kind of hungry. It's got to feed itself. It's like an endless appetite. So this is, uh, Babylon is basically, in some ways, in verse 5, is that they are drunk with success. They are drunk with success. They have conquered, 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 conquered. And they think this is the way it's always going to be. So we have then the five woes that God has for us that we see in, in, in uh, Habakkuk chapter 2. So there's five woes. Uh, we'll go through those pretty quickly, but independently. But I want to show you something, too, when it comes to how God... I keep forgetting to bring my little stand up here, so I'll put this here. Um, there are two sets of ten lines of poetry. So if you look in your Bibles, and you look at chapter 2, and you look at verse 6, it goes to the end in our Bibles, it goes to verse 20. Uh, but the first line of verse 6, as it's done there, is not part of the poetry. It's an introduction. So from basically 6b down to the end of the chapter, there are two sets of ten lines of poetry. Some Bibles lay this out much better than others. Some of the NIV Bibles lay it out really well. Some of the ESV Bibles lay it out really well. Um, there's other Bibles that just kind of keep a continuous you know, run, and you can't quite see it that way. But there's two sets of ten lines of poetry, each ending with the Lord's provident presence. And so we see this. So in the midst of the woes, verse 14 says this, but the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's at the end of the first ten lines. At the end of the second ten lines, we have this, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. So in the midst of all this woe, we have wonder. Don't forget that, brothers and sisters. In the midst of all these woes that we might have around us, there is wonder. There is wonder. God has not forsaken his people, his creation. It is his. There are five woes. 
Three of them come in the first ten lines, and two of them come in the second ten lines of this poem. Uh, and a woe, it's really hard for me. How do you, we don't use the word. In fact, the, the word woe, they, you know, the, the Oxford Dinglish, Dinglish, the Oxford English Dictionary, when your nose is stuffed up, you say the stupidest things. <laughs> the Oxford English Dictionary, the, these people that watch this stuff, you know, they have graphs for how long this word is used. And so the woe was something in the 1800s, 1700s was used a lot. By the time 1900 and around our time, the word woe was not used near as much. But there's something that carries in this woe that there's something gone wrong. There's something, whoa, what's going to happen now? Somebody can say it like that. To me, it's a really strong ufta. It's a really strong ufta. Now we're in for it. Or something's not, something's not quite right. This is not good. You can fill all these kind of things in there. But a woe is something also it, to, it should bring people up. Because when you, and I know I'm mixing English now, when you, I've never done, I'm not, sorry, I don't know horses, but how do you tell a horse to stop? What do you say? Whoa. And a woe, when God speaks a woe, what should happen? You should back up and listen a little bit here. Now remember, God is speaking to Habakkuk, and he's giving the woes, and, even, but the, and the woes weren't necessarily addressed to Babylon specifically, but through the prophet we see them. So there's, in these woes, then they're broken down into three parts, and I would, I would say the first part is the wo Babylon's woeful activity. What did Babylon do? And then the second part is, what's the consequence for what they did? And then the third part is the reason for the consequence. So you get that? There's the activity that Babylon did, the consequence for what Babylon did, and then the reason for the consequence, because that puts it back in God's wheelhouse again. Is everything in God's wheelhouse? Yes. Does man listen to the, the, to the deriver of the, of the world and the universe? Not very well. So he sends some woes. Now the reason, or at this point, it's, uh, we can't forget that uh, God is answering Habakkuk's question of justice. This rings through the whole book. God is answering the question of justice in the book of Habakkuk. Mark Ward writes this. Habakkuk was wondering how a good God could permit such evil to transpire, and God told him simply to wait patiently and trust him. Habakkuk, and now his readers, like us, may be wondering how, how can we possibly just wait and trust for this to work out? The past has been traumatic, the future is uncertain, and the present is painful. What assurances can you give me that it will be worth the wait? Because sometimes waiting is really hard, is it not? Really hard. That's why we have fast food, because we can't wait for slow food. I don't know. What is slow food? Maybe there's, an, maybe there's a place out there that advertises, we make slow food. But waiting, waiting is part of our faith. <clears throat> waiting is an incredibly important part of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what are we waiting for? His return. Did he promise it? Did God promise it? Yes. Waiting is an important part of our faith. And the woes that we have here are just an assurance that God is, knows what's going on. Now, woes themselves are not assurances other than, again, the idea that makes us stop up short, think about what we did, doing. So let's just go through these woes real quick. Woe number one. We begin the first woe and... In uh, verse 6, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own for how long and loads himself up with pledges. This is just a, a shadow or a showing of, of 
Babylon's greed and gluttony. It was accumulating and piling up debts is what it was doing. In some ways, it wasn't borrowing money from other countries. In, in the way that they treated other countries, be, put them into debt because they, were, they went beyond what was necessary most of the time. And they piled up these debts of their actions. And then the consequence is the tide will turn. Verse 7, will not your debtors suddenly arise and those who awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoiled for them. So these nations that you have put down, you may have your time, Babylon, but those nations will rise up some way and you will get what you have given. You will not go on forever. And then... The reason for the consequences in verse 8, because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. For the blood of the violence. Just, there comes, a, there comes a, almost in these kinds of things a mob mentality. People do things in mobs they would never do by themselves. And violence comes out of it. So you did not, you, you just did this to be violent. In other words, God is saying, you did this in some ways just to show you could do it and you could be in charge and do it. And you slaughtered people just for the fact of slaughtering them. One of the Mongol emperors, what was his name? I can't remember. Uh, he, he would... When he, he would conquer a city, he would pile the skull, the, the heads, the beheads out in the front gate, thousands of them. Just to say, I am the conqueror. Woe number two. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. So Babylon's activity was to become unconquerable. Now, if you want to be a nation, what do you want to be? You want to be unconquerable. So you build up arms, you build up everything. And this has gone on time and time again all over. We see it even now today. We don't want to be conquered by anybody. We want to be unconquerable. And so that's what Babylon's head do us. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high. He'll do, he'll do whatever it takes to gain strength to be strong, and nobody can mess with them. Well, what's the consequence? Verse 10. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. So basically, again, it's the opposite of the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. You know, in this, in this case, it's the, uh, we will, if... <laughs> We will make sure that people know we're boss. Well, guess what? There's going to come a day when the, ch the boss's nameplate is changed and you will be underneath somebody else. Now, what's the reason for this? Look at what it says. This is fun. Verse 11. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Does your house talk to you? Now, again, we're dealing with poetic language here. This is, this is what we're dealing with here. So we're, we're seeing this is a picture almost. But one of the things that Babylon did in its conquering of other nations, and especially in Le what we know today as Lebanon, and it was known as Lebanon back then too, Lebanon was known for its trees. And they cut thousands of them down, dragged the beams to Babylon to build palaces with. Um... Again, where we live, would we recognize where we live 120 years ago? No, be 100, maybe 130 years ago. All the trees had just, if you lived out by Drummond, out by Grandview, you had a grand view because they came in and took them all. They chopped them all down. That only comes from greed. That certainly wasn't good planning. And so when it says this, that means the Babylonians, 
you know, are sitting in their nice houses, enjoying all their luxuries. Nebuchadnezzar, is this not the great city that I have built? Conquered. Everything around him says, we are on the top. We have conquered. And God says, stones and beams that you have taken from other people are witnesses against you. How you have built yourself. Woe number three. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Babylon's activity, what was it? They had no mercy. Might is right. No matter the measures. It just whatever we got to do to conquer, we're going to do it. We're going to subjugate people no matter what it takes. If you put enough pressure on somebody, eventually they're going to bust and break. So he builds it with blood. He builds it with iniquity. He builds it with injustice because he, justice is in their hands. We are the ones who define justice. Well, what's the consequence? Verse 13, behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations worry themselves for nothing? <laughs> and this is part of the book of Habakkuk. You think you're in charge. I'm just using you for my purposes. I have bigger, greater purposes in mind. Babylon, you may think you're the top of the, up top of the heap, but you're nothing more than a tool in my hand. You will be used up, is in some ways what you could say. What they thought would be permanent, so the consequence is that what they thought would be permanent will go away quickly like logs on a fire. How many of you like logs to last for a long time? Put one log in a day and that's enough. You know, a little thing like that. That's all you need to heat your house for the whole day. What do you got? If you've got a fire, what do you got to do? You keep feeding it. Keep feeding it. You think you will become permanent? Not a chance. There's not a nation on this earth right now that is permanent as we define nations. The reason, verse 14, one of these beautiful things, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Permanence is God's kingdom. That's permanent. That's the only permanence that, would, that is for sure. The rulership of God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Woe number four starts in verse 15. Now, I, I want us to remember that all these five woes are a, basically a fleshing out of verse five. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. So that's why the woes, the five woes are coming upon Babylon. Woe to him who makes his neighbor drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. So what's Babylon's activity? What did they do? They plied other nations with, in some ways with wine in order to take advantage of them. I don't, there's not a month that goes by. And I'm, I'm on a news fast for the month of February. Pray for your pastor that he does not break down and, and start watching the news again. I need, I need to break in my head, okay? But there's not a month that goes by I don't read a story that is somehow based on somebody's abuse of alcohol and what happens when, they, when either they are drunk and something happens to them because of somebody else or something happens to them because they're drunk. And so Babylon, God says, is, is like that. He plies the nations with wine. Now, is there, I think there's a good example of this in, in Scripture that deals with Jerusalem itself, and that is the story of Hezekiah and Babylon. Now, Hezekiah was long dead before, before Babylon even conquered the, 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 the city of Jerusalem. But it says this in chap, Isaiah chapter 39. At that time, Merodach Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon. So this is the guy that precedes Nebuchadnezzar. Sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he'd heard he'd been sick and recovered. Oh, 
Hezekiah was pleased and showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the precious oil, his whole armory, and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all of his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And where are, have they come to, come to you from? Hezekiah said, They have come to me from the far country from Babylon. These are schmoozers. These are diplomats. These are influencers. These are embassy people coming to Jerusalem to see King Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah is like, yeah, I'll show them what we got. Can you imagine the eyes of the Babylonians when they went into the temple and saw the stuff that was in there? What did they, did they say, we're going to come here and worship God? Not a chance. They said, this is going to be ours someday. We're coming to get it. Have they seen, what have they seen in your house? They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers laid up in store this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And so your sons who will issue from you, from whom, whom you will beget, will be taken away and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. And then this, this, this verse is just amazing. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, for there will be peace and truth in my days. <laughs> I blew it, but my grandsons are going to pay for it. That's, it's just a flaw. We don't have time to really go into that. But what should people have come to Jerusalem for? Worship of the one true God. That was nation Israel's responsibility to the nations to demonstrate the righteousness and the holiness and the goodness of God Almighty. And they forsook it. And they got grabbed in by all the other stuff the nations get grabbed into. Well, back to this fourth woe. It's then the idea of uh, the Babylon's activity was, you know, basically schmoozing but eventually schmoozing turned into conquering. You know, if you can't talk them into giving up, well, we'll just kill them then, basically. The consequence, verse 16, you will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. You wanted to expose other people? you will be exposed for what you are as well. This is God's woe to them. The reason, verse 17, and I would call this the doctrines of violence are doctrines. The violence, violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that are, have terrified them. For the blood of man and the violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. The last line of verse 17 is a repeat, if you, if you remember, it's a repeat of the last line of verse 8. For the blood of man, the violence to the earth, to cities, and all who dwell in them. Uh, the doctrines of violence are the idea of conquest. You know, doctrines are just a way of saying this is, this is a direction. This is what we'll do. So we've had in our, we've had in our, American history, if you remember back in Mrs. Smith's class when you were in eighth grade or whatever, you had the Monroe Doctrine. The West will take care of We don't want the Europeans over here. We're going to take care of them. I hope I got that one right. Did I get that one right? It's the idea of act, you know, how are you going to act? What, do you, what are your actions? That's doctrines. How, you know, it's not just something that sits on a table. It's something that transfers from there to the actions. So violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. The doctrines of violence is what is the way that, basically the way that Babylon worked. And again, I just, abortion is a doctrine of violence. It's just, it's a, a violent thing. So what's the consequence then? Or I mean, the, the reason for the consequence is this. 
the violence they've done is your quest for self-glory is sin. All quests for self-glory is sin. It's, it's falling short of God's glory. It's not giving him his right place. And these doctrines of violence are just one of the things that, that bring people and just show the contrast between them and a holy God. Woe number five begins in verse 6, 18. Actually, it's a little reversed here. So what we have first is the consequence, then we have the woe. And I've read why, why Habakkuk, what'd you, you know, what'd you do this for? But these are God's words, so... Some people say, well, this is just the way they ended poetry this way. They reversed it a little bit. I don't know. But the, the woe is in verse 19. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. So the... Then backing up to verse 18, this is the consequence. We'll look at this again. What profit is in an idol when a maker has shaped it, a metal image and a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. The consequence is that self-glory is self-trust. Self-glory, self-trust, you will finally betray yourself. Did you know that? Apart from God, you will finally betray yourself. You may think you're headed towards life. You may think you've got it figured out. But if God is not part of you, who you are and what you're doing, you will betray yourself. There will be nothing to help in the time of need. Babylon's activity was they created their own gods. They, they, they made idols. They created, they created their own, they shaped and formed things in their, what they desired. They created their own gods. And the reason then for the consequence and the reason for uh, God's actions against them is, is what's beautiful is this. Look at verse 20. This is, the, this is the reason for the consequence of the woe. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. What? What? Well, back up to verse 19 again. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake. Now. Confession time here. How many of your cars have talked to you? Mike, knock it off. Really? I can tell when something's wrong. Well, yeah. But I mean, they have this nice little voice other than beep, beep, beep. All right, not that new. <laughs> When's the last time your house talked to you? Yeah, groaned. All right, I'll give that. I think, I think this kind of language you resonate with, don't you? You, you kind of know that piano does not talk unless what happens? It's played. Somebody plays it. And so one of the, the biggest stumbling stones is, is the idea that um, there is no God but God. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, if God is only God, then how can, you make, how can there be other gods then? It's because we make them. And so this is amazing because then it says, can this teach? Can, can your idols teach you? Behold, is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath in it at all. It cannot speak. So what should happen? Be silent before God the maker. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. So what we have is a contrast of silences here. The silence of the idols is that they're so stupid they, they can't tell you to do anything. They're, they're dumb. Dumb in the idea that they, you can't speak and dumb because they can't, they, they can't teach you anything. So when we, next week we get to enter into the, you know, basically, wonderfully, it draws this all together in the book, the complaining, and then God's speaking about that complaint, the next complaint, and then God speaks to that complaint as well. 
But all through that, he's been building this up. God has been teaching, showing us through this, in the midst of all that we see in the injustice around us, all the things, the circumstances that don't always go the way we'd want them to, all the circumstances that place a lot of pressure on us, he's never left. He's there. And it's us who practice his presence. We are the ones who begin. We don't make God come to present. We don't create God. We listen. And some of the best way to listen is to be silent. Hands out. Lord. So the woes of wrong glory, Babylon has embraced itself as, a glor as glorious. Babylon is in basically, as it's what we see here, Babylon has built up its self-image, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. It has created its own self-image. Now, I know that self-image is an important tool, you know, that we shouldn't be talking ourselves down all the time, oh, woe was me, that kind of stuff, oh, I use woe, all that kind of stuff. But they created their own self-image. But who did they have to compete with eventually? We can't compete against God. So why don't we just surrender? Because he loves us. Surrender to him. Give him glory by trusting him. Give him glory by trusting the one way he has made for us to come to know him through the son who he sent to be our savior. Just open up to him. See, Babylon embraced itself as glorious. It wanted to be honored. It wanted worship. It wanted the worship of other nations. It was a boastful nation. <laughs> so much. Do you see boasting among the nations today? Oy, oy, oy. It's everywhere. And some of it's like, okay, I mean, my soccer team's better than your soccer team. All right, this year, but next year. It's boasting. But they were very short-sighted. They had really woeful worship. They worshiped themselves, and nothing is worse. So again, just revisiting, I want to put up here Habakkuk 2, verses 13 and 14. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire, nations grow weary for nothing? So who puts into play this cycle of nations? Who puts into play the cycle of the nations? God does. The rises and the falls. Now, I'm glad my forefathers in World War II decided that Hitler was somebody to be stood up against. I'm glad for that. But even in the midst of that, is it mankind who delivers mankind? See, this is, this is the mankind's folly. Mankind's folly is that he thinks he himself will deliver himself. And so the Lord brings upon us these, this comings and going. The nations grow weary for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Is it completely there yet, brothers and sisters? No. Is it coming? Yes. Hold on and keep walking with him. This is one of the main lessons we get from Habakkuk. That no matter what, we will worship him and honor him as God and only him as God. So then Habakkuk 2.20, we see this. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. There is nobody like him. Nobody can compete with him. Bow. We're about to take communion this morning, and I want to take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 1.
verse 18 begins, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who have been saved is the power of God. The word of the cross is foolishness. Babylon looked into Jerusalem, saw its earthly treasures, but when they went there, when Merodach Baladin, the king, went there, he saw the treasures that were earthly kind of treasures. He did not see God. He thought that stuff was foolishness because conquering my way is the way. To those who are perishing, this is foolishness, the word of the cross. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever. I will set aside all the skepticisms, all the unbeliefs, all the excuses. God will wipe them away someday. There will be no excuse before him to not glorify him. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Where is the computer technician? Where is the genetic scientist? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased. This is interesting. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So he's just playing on the words. What the world thinks is foolishness, there is wisdom. And that wisdom has a focus. Jews ask for sign, Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Gentiles foolishness. But those who are called, again, Habakkuk was, he knows his nation, Israel, is called of God out of all the nations. They were chosen to be his nation. Habakkuk believed that. He trusted that. Yet he wrestled with his own nation, seeming to forsake that. God answers him in a way he didn't think he would. Yes, I will discipline my people. I will bring in the Babylonians. That's that's a strange way to do things, God. No, it's not. How do you tell me what is strange? I'm God. I have my purposes here. It may seem like foolishness, but it is not. But those who are called, so he knows his nation is called, and God shows through the book of Habakkuk, he shows it all the way through, he will always be faithful to those he calls. He will bring them to their end that he has promised. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For consider your calling. Now, this is interesting. So he's called and then calling. So the call is this purpose of God to save. Calling carries the idea of in the midst of what? How does it look? Consider your calling, brethren. There were not many according wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, not many of those who were arrogant, you could almost say, who had sold their souls out to arrogance of the world. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. The base things of the world despise God has chosen. The things that are not, so he nullifies that which are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. To whom do we owe our salvation? To ourselves or to God? We owe it to him. Because apart from him moving in us, we would not come to him. And he moved us. Who became to us the wisdom of God. Righteousness, sanctification, so that it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So brothers and sisters, when we come to a table like this today, It's a boast. It's a boast. Man, if I wasn't so good looking, you know, that kind of stuff, if I wasn't so good looking, I wouldn't have that job or I wouldn't have found that woman or if if I didn't know how to make money, I wouldn't be able to do this, I wouldn't be able to do that. Man, if I wasn't so smart, I'd have to work for somebody else. 
all that goes away. Because all stand accountable before God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And yet, he sent his son so that he died for the ungodly, Paul says. Died for the ungodly. And we were all fall short of his glory. And yet, he sent his son for us. He, he gave and he bestowed his love upon us. And now, he's opened our eyes to receive from him. And so now, yes, we are boasters. But we boast in our God, not in ourselves. So the table is a place of boasting. Thank you, God. Praise God. Glory be to God. Because he did something I couldn't do for myself. Amen to that? Lord, we boast in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. To you, Lord Jesus, belongs the glory. And to you, someday, you, your promise is that we will eat with you. We will see you face to face. You've given us this to remember. You've washed away our sins by your death on the cross. Your resurrection shows that death no longer has power over you. And you have promised the same to us in you. And this is beautiful because you say that you abide with us. Lord, we abide with you. We live in you. We live because of you. Lord, may you receive those who come forward this day. And may their faith in you grow strong. That we keep our eyes straight ahead and we walk with you. Lord, when the world around us shouts that you do not love us, you're not there. You're impotent. You can't do Lord, may we rise up and worship. May we never give in. And may we trust you to the very end, which is not the end. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.